back to how it's done. To, on today's episode, we're going to be going over part two of our series of the Restored Church of God with former member Mark. How are you doing? I'm doing, hanging in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to thank everybody for watching our part one. Our goal was in part one to get a lot of the community's questions out of the way. And today on part two, we're going to give you more of the financials and the background of David Pack uh, for what everybody has been questioning about. So we left off at last time talking about Common. If you can please explain, explain Common again and sure. go into that. The, there are biblical prin principles that are financial, which is what everybody's heard of. is called tithes and offerings. The, the three tithes, three ten percents. And then there's a holy day offering. Seven times a year, you give an offering, and that's kind of a free will offering as far as how much you give. Okay. It's, there are other things called free will offerings, but that's not what we're talking about. So the church is structured in a way where you can give as much as you can possibly give. And common is the teaching that is exclusive to David Pack. None of the other splinters, uh, you know, churches that broke off from the Worldwide Church of God after Herbert W. Armstrong died. And a lot of different groups uh, were created, uh, much larger than, than Restored. And Restored was established in 1999. David Pack came out of Global Church of God. Starting in about 2007, I believe, was when he first gave a sermon about um, called the Clarion Call. When they knew they wanted to build a campus, but they didn't have the finances, so he put out a sermon called the Clarion Call, which basically was a plea to the brethren to give money. Okay. And apparently they responded so well, they were able to move forward with the campus, start getting into permits, looking into purchasing the land and, and then whatnot. But then later down the road, um, he came to understand, he came to understand a doctrine called common, which is in the book of Acts, all the brethren came together and they gave what, whatsoever had need so that they had all common. There was a four-hour or six-hour sermon series that he gave that explained all the teachings of Jesus Christ. Are you serious that long? Oh, that's that's a, a drop in the bucket for the way Dave Pack can speak. He can speak two, three hours, and, and later on when we talk about his Elijah, that prophet sermon, he, he spoke for six hours that day, okay. three two-hour sermons. Now, can I ask for this comment? Sure. Do any other splinter churches do no. it? Um, did... Uh, Worldwide Church of God, did no. they do it? So no. it's exclusive to Restore Church of God. That's correct, because okay. the Worldwide Church of God had over 100,000 members. So when you have tithes and offerings, you can actually support a lot more than you can when you're a church of, you know, maybe 2,000 people or 1,500, last I heard, 1,500 baptized members, not total members, but baptized members. Well, what Common does, it opens the door to being able to have people sell property, sell homes, um, to give the church a lot more money than they normally would. The thing about Common is, though, it's a very visceral topic, and some people have had some horrific experiences with Common as far as pressure directly from the ministry, from what they heard from the pulpit, from Dave Paxay himself, that there's a lot of peer pressure to give Common. And I know that I didn't quite frame it as strongly as I could have last time, only because it was an introduction. But common is not optional. And Dave Pack will often say common is not optional. It's a command. It is a just as enforceable in God's eyes, according to David C. Pack, as thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt, you know, the Ten Commandments. It's that important. In fact, the way he preaches it is that you cannot get into the kingdom unless... You obey the common doctrine. So you're stating that besides the regular tithe of the 10% every year and the other that goes towards, um, how, do, how did you state it, the once a year? Uh, the Once every three years is third tithe. Third tithe. Okay. So this common is mandated. Now, what happens if they can't give this extra common, like sell things that they have to give to the church? That's the problem that some people have. I know people that have lost sleep over it, that they have businesses and they need to invest in the future. They need to buy equipment. 
There's big front end investments. They're farmers. They have to buy equipment. They have to buy seed. They have to plan ahead. And yet, how much do you give the church is based on how much they can afford to keep their lives going. And if you have faith that Christ is going to return and that this is also like a test command, that you won't get into the kingdom until you give common and only you and God know what that price is, people lose sleep over it. It's, it's something that is very stressful. It uh, tears families apart, husbands and wives having disagreements. Uh, parents fretting because their parents are selling their home just to give church the church money or you know senior citizens um, you know doing fundraisers with knitting and baking so that they can give you know what's called widow's mites widow's mites because in this in the scriptures it does talk about God God values those who give out of their lack versus out of their abundance so the members go ahead and give this extra which is common mm -hmm. However, it has been discussed that the Restored Church of God does not go ahead and help its members financially like you would say like an average church would. You know, hard times during Christmas, presents for the kids, things like that. Somebody needs help with rent. If they have all this money coming in, why are they not using this to help their members? According to David Pack, the common is used to help preach the gospel. Third tithe assistance is what is the financial institution that God set in place to help those in the church who are in need. They have to apply for third tithe assistance, and the ministry makes a judgment call about whether or not you'll receive third tithe, how much that third tithe will be. They try to use things like welfare and unemployment and any other government structure in order to not have to shell out money. Because if you're taking, giving money to the brethren, you're taking away from God's work. And okay. that's, that's how it's explained. So it's not that they won't help people. It's just really hard to get them to write a check for you. And if you do it, you better be spending it on the right thing or you will get a talking to about it. Like, why are you spending the money this way? Why are you spending the money that way? And that also adds to stress to people where they don't feel like they can even ask the church for help. Now, on the, along the lines of the financials, since he won't discuss how much the church brings in, you mentioned to me that he's using a Bible passage to justify why he does not at least disclose to his members sure. how much is coming in, where is it all going. Right. They don't volunteer information that invites criticism. It's much like... Dave Pack himself will not ask you a question ever that invites criticism. It's a very slick way of, um, so what was your favorite part of the sermon? Or what did you like the most? What was the most interesting to you? Not did you believe it or did I go to do a good job? In, in the same way, uh, where's the money going invites criticism. Well, I don't think we should go towards that, and I don't think it should go towards that. So they simply don't. Other churches like Cogwa and United and Living They'll put out their financials every year. And I remember Dave Pack criticizing those churches for doing that because he said it's none of the brethren's business where their money is going because it's not their money anyways. It's God's money. So you don't have a say. You don't need to know. We are, have to be the wise stewards with the money. You just pay and do your part, and then we'll do our part. And the problem with that is, is that the gospel is not being preached at the Restored Church of God. It was when I was there. World to Come was being recorded regularly. It was on YouTube. It was moving up into television. Literature was coming out. Literature was up to date. New literature was being written. But all that stopped when the Prophecy Series started. So one person could ask, you know, if I'm giving common, where is the money going? That's kind of a fair question. I didn't question it so much because I knew where it was going and I felt like if I really knew where the money was going, it would make me angry. And then if I got angry about it, then I might be disobeying a command of God. So I opted to just live in ignorance, which a lot of people choose to do because otherwise it'll drive you crazy. Now I noticed in my research looking on the Restored, Restored Church of God's website that the material is outdated. He hasn't come out with any new books, even though a lot of these books were 
written by Herbert Armstrong, and there hasn't been a lot of new stuff. So I can justify funds wanting to have material to give to members, to give to people who want to learn. But that is not the case, just like it's not the case with the agriculture going on that they said that they were going to go ahead and do. Correct. Yeah, there's a lot of things that are no longer in play that were, we were, I don't want to say sold, we were told, we were preached to, this is what the money is going to be for, we're going to build this beautiful campus, world leaders are going to come here, and then it became the mountain city is going to come out and, and land here, so we have to have this wonderful place. And it's only very recently that Dave Pack has done a reversal on the purpose of the campus. Okay. Just recently he said, oh, it's just a gift to the, to the, to the church and the brethren. So why would I give you a quarter of a million dollars as a gift just so you can have more horses and more trees for you to enjoy, to have a half-mile wooden fence put along the highway because you don't want to see the freeway and you don't want people to see your house or you want to hear it? So that's why the fence was put up along The, the wise, I can only speculate as to okay. wise, but knowing him the way I do, and there was a black screen over there for years that was a, both yes. a sound baffle as well as for uh, privacy. A, a big storm took that down, and then instead they put up this, uh, I don't know if it's six or seven feet long, but ask any carpenter or any construction person how much a fence like that, a wooden fence that goes for almost a half mile, how much that costs. That's where the common money is going. It's going so David and his wife, his wife is actually a really wonderful person. I don't want to speak ill of her. She's super nice. They like to ride horses, which is why the Restored Church of God, car, God has a barn with horses. So is there any, I would say, biblical or religious reason why Restore Church of God has horses? No. Do the other members use it? Uh, I'm other, just trying to understand. Yeah, headquarters, the la when I was, again, I've been gone for a year. Things mm -hmm. may have changed. There's nuances to all this. They invited any people who lived in the local area and actually during socials, if you would like to ride the horse, you can come and ride the horses. And there are actually members who have history riding horses and they ride them too. So it is communal in that way, but how often people ride horses and does it justify the expense? And I always personally wondered, and I don't have the answer, did Dave Pack write a check out of his personal checking account to buy the horses? Did that come out of church funds? And what widow sacrificed and knitted, you know, crocheted little doilies and sold them at $3 a pop just so Dave Pack could have a horse? I don't know that answer, but that's a question I've always had. So basically, I could not ask to go to the church and ride the horse. I'd have to be a member. Yeah, that would be a good incentive for you to be a member. You could ride horses. Now, is there a reasoning <laughs> why, with how well financially Restored Church of God does, that they don't participate in their local community, surrounding communities, the county, uh, many churches, large and small, participate in different ways uh, with the uh, Main Street, Wadsworth uh, events that are downtown. Um, the Chamber of Commerce does a, a whole bunch of things as well, mm -hmm. but I do not see Restored Church of God doing anything. I mean, I could see in the wintertime, some of the churches, you know, putting out cocoa or doing things with the kids. Um, even if they are not into Halloween, they still try to participate to be in the community. But I don't see that from Restored Church of God. I see them as they are closed up, and that's why people have an issue with the gate. <laughs> it's always the gate, but they are not participating in the community. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that is a sore spot for a lot of people because sure. COVID brought so many businesses together. They brought so many churches together, everybody working together. It didn't matter your belief, but Restored Church of God still stayed in their own world. And I think that that has, has hurt some people that they do not participate or want mm -hmm. to be a part of anything community. Correct. They, they don't do any kind of outreach or uh, community related events. All the events that Restore does is for the internal membership, the summer picnic, winter social, Spokesman's Club, there's just various things, Ladies Tea, they, they do have events, but that's more for the membership. And the reason they don't participate in the community in Wadsworth or anywhere else is that this is the devil's world. It's not their job to fix the devil's world. 
So they're not going to open a soup kitchen or feed the homeless or, you know, help, you know, children with, uh, you know, leukemia because that's taking the money that God wants to preach the gospel and support his work in his church, not to play around with the devil's world. And I know that Dave Pack has been very critical of the other churches like the United Church of God. They'll help people in the Ukraine or whenever there's some kind of world crisis. I've seen them do it online. They do local fundraisers. They try to give donations. They try to help people. But Restore just doesn't do that because that's a waste of money. The money goes to God's work, not to be sucked dry by Satan's world. Could you give me, after we talk, some examples when it comes to a member giving common that has hurt them? The, the emotional pain is probably more so than just the financial pain. People lose sleep over it, like I mentioned earlier. They get stressed out about it. How much should they give? If their salvation depends on this, they're not going to get into the kingdom. You know, if I add an extra zero, what I get in, and it's always the, well, you're not buying your way in, but if you don't give, you're not going to be in at all. So it's one of those, like, disconnects of reality. It's like, well, which is true? Am I paying pay to play or... No, you have to do this, and God knows your heart, and you give what you can. I know of one particular woman in Canada that was so certain, and this ties into David Pack's false teachings and why it's so dangerous. Christ is coming. So she wanted to give common. She wanted to donate and sacrifice for the work. Okay, good. She has four young girls, and she sold all her winter clothes and the winter clothes of her four children. Because why? Christ is coming before winter is over. So, of course, that winter comes, Christ doesn't, and now she and her four children do not have winter clothes. They had to go to other members in their area and ask for help. Can you please help us with this, help us with that? And they actually were able to scrape together enough clothes to keep that family warm during the winter. That's just one example of somebody sacrificing uh, above and beyond. Now, there are stories about the Worldwide Church of God when Herbert Armstrong would say, send in your money, and you know people wouldn't go to the dentist. They'd let their tires go bald. That still kind of happens in Restored. People hold off, oh, I don't know if I want to take this vacation because i got to give in common. Or uh, Dave Pack has repeatedly taught members should not have pets. Pets are a financial drain on you, and besides, when the kingdom comes and you're a spirit being, you won't be able to take care of them anyways. So don't have pets. And yet he has horses. But isn't pet, you pets. know, part of God's creatures? Sure. But if it gets in the way of the money, then you got you to gotta step back. And another way it's harmful to people is the pressure that's put on them. Um, I've, been very, I've been trying to be careful about conveying stories that I know my friend is the one that this mm -hmm. happened to. But if you go online, you will read a lot of horror stories about common and how detrimental it is, people fretting about their parents. Uh, giving up their retirement. I gave up my retirement. I was all in with common. I don't have a retirement right now. I cashed in my retirement. I did not have savings for a very long time. I trusted that God would guide me through and, you know, I didn't get sick. I didn't, Restore Church of God can't afford health insurance for its employees, so I didn't have health insurance either. Um, but there are people that I know, there was one woman who was at the feast, and David Pack, David C. Pack, sat at a table with another minister and maybe a third minister, pressuring this woman, pressuring. Well, you know, if you got divorced from your husband who's not a member, you could sell your house and take your part of the money and give it to the church. And when I heard that, it was almost unbelievable that he's actively counseling somebody to break up a marriage which God said is it's a bind until you die for money. But I thought you said that he doesn't break up marriages, especially when it comes to if somebody comes in already interracially married. Right. That, that, well, that has nothing to do with the money. When it, you know, and the story I told last time mm -hmm. about the man who pledged more and then wanted yeah. to keep his wife, if, if, if Dave Pack would have had his way, he would have had that woman out and gone 
who cares about that man's marriage? I don't care about him. We would have got another $100,000 out of him. And that speaks to his character and his attitude about common. But because it's preached so heavily that you're not getting salvation unless you do this. This is a command of God. It is a faithless thing for you to not give common. People have crisis of conscience. How much can I do without? How much can I, okay, well, maybe I'll sell my house and give, you know, pay rent for a while because I'll only be renting because Christ is coming in a couple of weeks anyways. But what about the people that are, you know, don't have much retirement, that are on Social Security? H how are they supposed to give common so they can be part of the church? Those people have to negotiate with God in their hearts and in, on their knees when they're praying as far as how much they give. The church does not expect people who are on those kind of assistance programs to give very much common. And then in that point, it's like it's barely a tithe. What they want are the people that have substance, houses, property, vehicles, extra things that they can do without. Um, and I have to be careful when I say this, but somebody had reminded me recently, do you remember when Dave Pack got up and said, hey, everybody, or to certain people, you should take out a loan from a bank or max your credit card and give the money to the church. I don't remember hearing that. It sounded familiar, but sometimes, to be fair, when I would hear some of these things from the pulpit that he would say, it was so like out of bounds and wacky that I just didn't commit it to memory. But there are people out there who will swear They'll, they'll attest to their affirmation that that's actually something. How that do the current ministers under David Pack condone this? Well, they go along with whatever he says. There's, they're yes men. I would call them lackeys in a way. Now, I like some of these men. Some of these men I like a lot. I had a lot of good interaction with them. They were nice to me. But at the same time, they're also enablers. And they will be kind of the little soldiers that go out and enforce Dave Pack's will. Nothing happens at the Restored Church of God without his say-so. People don't move. There's no house. This doesn't happen, this marriage, unless Dave Pack says so. So he trains these men to go out and be like, think of an octopus with eight tentacles. Yes. Each man is trained to be his tentacle because he can't control everything at the same time. But if you train a man to do the job you want, those men will then train others, and so eventually you have men who are in the, the, called the field ministry, those in the min, all over the world that are outside headquarters, and then those men know about common, and that when new people come in, you kind of grease them. If they have a lot of substance, I know for a fact, if, they, if a new member has a lot of substance, oh man, they are so nice to you, so complimentary, oh, it's so wonderful that God is doing this to you, they really butter you up. Wow, you could do great things in this church, you know. You know, they, they kind of wine and dine you in a way because then it's easier to write a check because you feel good about what you're doing and you're giving the money to God, so therefore um, therefore you're more apt to give. But that, that strategy comes all the way from the top, which is David C. Pack, who then teaches all the men in headquarters to do what they're doing, and then they counsel the field ministers, and then eventually it gets to all the brethren. Now, I know that you have talked about um, still keeping in contact with those that have left the church and some are ministers. And could you explain some of their feelings as they left in regards to specifically the common? There, different people leave for different reasons and different men are more forthcoming and they all have different experiences. So there, there's a cornucopia and a yeah. rainbow of experiences. So I'm not saying that every minister X, Y, Z. I do know that almost without a doubt, every single minister that has left that I have remained friends with or have talked to have apologized for something. They knew they were violating their conscience when they were ministers because that's what they were supposed to do. They're following the playbook. They're you know, doing what you know, Dave Pack wants. They're on board with him. They're on board with him until the day they're not. A lot of these men suffer from bitterness, PTSD, um, stress, guilt, shame. One man is, seems to be, and I don't, I'm not a psychologist, I can't diagnose him, seems to be so um, full of guilt and shame, it's the only way I can see it, where he's cut off contact with anybody in RCG. Like, he doesn't even want to, like, be friends with them. It, it, I would think that, that it's because that man violated his conscience so deeply he can't look people in the eyes. Now, when I left the Restored Church of God, I didn't need to apologize to anyone for anything. Because I, 
held to what I knew was right and stuck to it even when I got in trouble from time to time over it. The ministers, every one of them, and I guarantee you every single minister who's watching this right now at the Restored Church of God, who sits in that room, in that beautiful wooden room, listen to Dave Tack spout for hours and hours and hours, you know he's lying. And you know what you're doing is wrong. And every minister who's left finally admits, I was wrong. I compromised. They all say it. Now, we're all human beings, and we do the best we can. We've got families to consider. We've got our own careers. You know, there's the, wow, well, I'm, you know, this kind of minister. I'm that kind of minister. But in the end, they're all human beings. And the people that have left, it's a process of grieving and coming to the reality of what you did. And those men, some of them are pretty, you know, broken. Some of them are, are very upset, but also, you know, they're trying to move on with their lives. And I appreciate the ones that say, hey, Mark, you know, I'm sorry I did this to you. It's like, wow, you're like the third minister that's like apologized for me. I'm glad you remembered that because I remembered that and I took note of it. But even if you didn't, I, you know, I still care about you. So they're nice people there, but they're deceived and being deceived. And they're also the hands of Dave Pack doing his work that is just completely and utterly unbiblical. Now, going into David Pack, um, looking into he is the head and you mentioned that he has multiple titles yes all right so there's other areas that i want to get to um but first we have to start with david pack his titles and how that came to be and sure so there's there's a separation of dave pack david c pack the man versus david c pack the preacher as full disclosure, I actually had a very decent relationship with him. And I relationship, I mean, I could chat with him. Dave Pack was always nice to me. I cannot say I have this personal horror story about how awful Dave Pack is. I don't have that story. And that's not something that um, I can uh, relay other people's stories from time to time. I'm actually going to relay some stories that speak to his character from people I know. But he was always nice to me. And a lot of the ministers that are there, nice to me, nice people. I'd sit and have a cup of coffee with them, no problem. It's David C. Pack's teachings that are the problem that I took issue with that are unbiblical, and ultimately it's the reason I left. So just for folks who know, there's going to be a document on the links that has this document in front of you if you want to go through and actually read in the Bible yourself. Um, David Pack has claimed that he is Elijah the prophet, that he is that prophet that he is like Moses, that he is Joshua the high priest, he's Ezekiel's watchman, he's a type of Ezekiel. Uh, Elijah's the one that cries out to the to ten virgins that the bridegroom is coming. Elijah is the porter. He wondered for a while, is he the one that utters the seven thunders to the other six messengers in the book of Revelation? And then up until recently, he's David, the righteous king. So whenever you go through the Bible and read about a future David, for years and years and years, Dave Pack said that was him. He's walked that back recently, and that's the interesting thing about him. He no longer believes the Mountain City is coming to the campus, and he no longer believes, or at least teaches right now, that he's David. The problem is, is that he will hammer it for hours and hours and reinforce it for years, and then kind of as an aside under his breath say, oh, well, I'm, I'm not David anymore. When you read that, that's not me. But anyways... It's like, wait a second, you, you spent like 12 hours talking about how you're David and then just kind of as an aside, oh, by the way, that's not me anymore. My question would be, well, then why did you believe that in the first place? If you're God's servant, God's apostle, and you're preaching that, you know, you're in the Bible. God put you there 2,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago, depending on the New Testament. But now that's not you, then why did you think that in the first place? And I know that none of those ministers who have access to him, who sit with him and talk with him and have coffee and suffer through his endless conversations. Why don't they ask him? Well, where did that come from then? So I have a very long list of scriptures that just my, for my own edification, as messages would be delivered, I started writing down where Dave Pack sees himself in the Bible. So the titles are what I read, but imagine for all the churchgoers out there, you're sitting in the audience and your minister opens the Bible and says, oh, that's me, flips a couple pages, oh, that's me. It's like, man, here I am again. Wow, I'm all over the scriptures. I can't help it. That's the way God wants it. I always found that to be kind of 
silly. But once he saw himself as Elijah and that prophet, it opened the door for him to be so much more. Um, 1 Samuel 2, 3, he's actually the faithful priest. He, Elijah is being spoken about in Psalm 50. Psalm 89, he's David. Isaiah 11, he's the twig. Uh, he, uh, he's the twig. Um, he speaks comfortably to Jerusalem in, in uh, Isaiah 40. In Isaiah 41, he's the righteous from the east. Mr. Pat, oh, you know, I'm, I'm the righteous from the east. God said it, not me. Um, Isaiah 58. Mr. Pack is the one to cry aloud and spare not. Uh, he used to teach in Ezekiel 34, my servant David is Dave Pack. Dave Pack is the plant of renown. He's David the king. He's in Joel, the teacher of righteousness. Uh, in Zephaniah 3.2, he's uh, Jerusalem obeyed not Dave Pack's voice. I mean, I could go on and on and on. It goes all the way to Revelation where Mr. Pack is actually John in some of the parts, and he, then he's actually the angel, which is messenger in, in the Greek in some places. But this all changes. This all change. It's a, it's a, it's, uh, if he were of the tribe of Reuben, I would understand because he's unstable as water. Dave Pack's teachings are unstable as water. You don't need to study it. You don't need to remember it. You don't need to even absorb it because all you have to do is wait a week or two or sometimes Monday. It's different. I changed it. And all the ministers agree, all the ministers agree, all the ministers agree, which is why I said that those men at headquarters are enablers. Because, oh, yes, we agree, we agree. He doesn't take a poll, hey, everybody, do you agree? That's not the way it works. It's just that, well, your silence is an admission that I'm right, and you can't come up with anything better, because, quite frankly, people can't follow along anyways with the man's teaching. For those that maybe have never been to church or, or just don't understand, could you break down what that means for him saying that, you know, he's the apostle, he's Elijah. Explain what that means to somebody who has mm -hmm. never been to church, per se. No, that's fair. There, uh, in the book of Malachi, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So in the Old Testament, there was a prophesied Elijah figure, which Elijah was long dead, so it's got to be somebody else. I will send you Elijah the prophet. So there is Old Testament prophecies that have New Testament and beyond fulfillments. So when I say Elijah or Joshua, these are biblical figures that God has put in his word that will be somebody. They will, there will be an Elijah if there is another one, but John the Baptist was a type of Elijah. So it depends on your understanding of this scripture and that scripture, but it's really those titles. And that prophet is taken out of Deuteronomy, which even in the book of Acts is Jesus Christ. And it's interesting that he claims that prophet. And actually some of the ministers, including myself, um, not a minister, but at the same time, when he declared himself Elijah and Elijah is that prophet, I lost sleep for three days. It was so disturbing to me. I knew that this was wrong. I read my Bible. This is a discontinued book with Dave Pack's name on it. Is that prophet alive today? This book is out of print. You can't find it in RCG. In fact, there's a couple of books here. I will send Elijah and then the Mr. Armstrong book. Okay. These books are no longer there because the new Mr. Pack is the Elijah teaching trumps all of it. But I just want to just read a couple of passages from this book. I don't need to condemn or um, accuse David Pack because he does it to himself. Okay, on page 30. Let's now prove who that prophet, who is that prophet. Allowing the Bible to interpret itself, he shall send Jesus Christ. And then he quotes more of Acts. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you like your breath. Uh, of your brethren like unto me. The Apostle Peter plainly, absolutely, unmistakably equates Jesus Christ with the prophet of Deuteronomy 18.15. This is why Mr. Armstrong taught this truth as he did. There is no possible way to read this passage, at least not with an honest mind. This is still Dave Pack talking about that prophet. The only prophet that all people from all previous ages could hear is Jesus Christ. He is the only possible candidate who could be heard in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. So there is only one conceivable way that any person alive today could claim to be that prophet. Again, Dave Pack claims he's that prophet. He would eventually have to claim that his writings are 
and revelations are to become part of Scripture. It can be easily proven that when Peter said this, he knew exactly what he was saying. Of course, God inspired him, and that should be enough to believe it. And this is the last part later in the, in the chapter. If someone claims to not only be a prophet, but also be that prophet, he is both a liar and a blasphemer. He makes himself God. He may be running, but God has certainly not sent him. If he claims titles belonging to the all-powerful living Jesus Christ, then he is no less than a blaspheming idol seeking to replace Christ himself. And then I actually am going to read one last part. This is for all the members of the Restored Church of God and all the ministers watching this. If you are part of the organization following that prophet, you are in the presence of a false, blaspheming human idol who seeks to steal your crown through directing your, directing your worship to him. So basically, David Pack is considering himself the apostle, the Elijah, the top dog that is going yes. to be when the end of times comes in, in his version that Restored Church of God is going to be the center of the world with Jesus coming down and he's going to be by Jesus' side. He's the only one. Is, this is what you're saying. He's the only living apostle, yes. And because he's Elijah and that prophet, there are no other figures. I'm not very versed in the Bible, but I do know enough that throughout different religions to claim yourself to be so high, <laughs> that's not good, is it? Well, that's your interpretation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's, it's amazing because Dave Pack has this way of reading the scriptures and applying it to himself and elevating himself. When he declared himself Elijah, which in another book, he was proving absolutely that Herbert W. Armstrong was Elijah. He had to dismantle that. And the only way that you can have a church and saying you're going to hold fast to what Mr. Armstrong teaches, come with Restore Church of God, we're going to teach all the things you used to know, including the Elijah teaching, in order for him to dismantle that, he had to do something very clever, which is elevate Mr. Armstrong to be a like Moses, to be a Moses figure. It's like, I'm not tearing down Mr. Armstrong. I'm, I'm building him up. And it was, it's, that's the shell game with the scriptures that Dave Pack will use. It'll be like street magician type stuff, a sleight of hand. Oh, don't look over here too much. Don't look over here because what I'm really doing is over here. That's what he does with the scriptures, and that's what he does with his teachings. With him going back and forth, declaring when he believes the end of times is going to come, mm -hmm. and as you've mm -hmm. described it, switched over and over again, how does that affect you personally? How does that affect the members, especially when they leave? That It almost sounds as if a soldier going to war, and when he gets out, he has internal injuries that you just can't see. And it kind of sounds like that a lot of people that have gone through that, and you mentioned some stories <laughs> in regards to those who have lost a loved one or a child. That to me is, that's mental abuse. Mm -hmm. um, could you describe some of that? Sure. So. The first part of your question is how do people, how do I handle it? How do people handle it? Everybody has their own ways of dealing with something that's uncomfortable or traumatic. You know, children that are in abusive homes have a way of coping. A spouse has a way of coping. Everybody has different coping me mechanisms. And in the Restored Church of God, everybody has to develop a prophetic coping me mechanism. It's the I know that you say you're speaking on God's authority and then you set a date and it doesn't come to pass, but yet you'll put a new spin on it to order to continue the process. Mm -hmm. And it's very damaging. It was damaging to me on a spiritual level as it is damaging to other folks. Some people have different degrees of how well they're handling it. Some people quit the church and go to Christmas and bacon. I, I haven't done that yet. Other people go to other splinter groups like Cogwell United and LCG because there's a lot of familiar teachings that happen, but there's always a sense of loss because when we were in the Restored Church of God, this was the place. When I came to the Restored Church of God, Mr. Pack was the voice. Like the world to come, the literature, 
This is where God's doing his work. I was all in financially. I was all in spiritually. I served. I sacrificed. I did what I could. A lot of people did way more than I did, way more than I did. So when you have that taken away from you, it creates almost a spiritual PTSD, let's call it, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, I personally am still not together spiritually. My foundation has been broken, not necessarily because I believed the man. I didn't join Restore Church of God for David Pack, but he was preaching the things that just made so much sense to me, and it was the right place of other people, like-minded people. So when he went off the rails in prophecy and started predicting things that just clearly didn't happen, I had to personally reconcile, okay, what is God doing? Would God let somebody continually, and then you would have to ask, is Mr. Pack lying to me? And then people ask questions. Is Dave Pack know what he's doing, or is he, is he completely delusional? And, you know, the, everybody has different questions for that. But more specifically, it's about, you know, people that are, are damaged by this. It's really the reason I'm, I'm doing this, the reason I'm willing to put my face on camera, the reason I'm willing to put my name out there to face ridicule, criticism, or whatever may come from it. Because I think that what people who are not religious can't understand is the emotional damage, the damage to families, to damage to people, to be damage to their hearts of what Dave Pack is doing. And to illustrate that, there are two couples that I know about that were in the headquarters congregation, just wonderful, wonderful people. One couple, their son, their teenage son, had an asthma attack while swimming and drowned in a pool. The other family, their daughter was murdered by her boyfriend. And I heard David Pack in sermons call out, you know, not at the same time, but certain couples, and sometimes together, call out the couples. Don't you want to see your son again? Well, you're going to see him real soon. You're going to see him mm -hmm. real soon. After services, he'd be talking in the corner, quiet with them, encouraging them. You're going to see your son. You're going to see your daughter. What he doesn't know or doesn't think to care is those parents going home crying, sometimes crying in hope that, wow, we're going to see our child, our dead child soon. What mother or father doesn't want to see their dead children again? What um, husband or fa um, doesn't want to see his wife again? And the man does not have the courage or the mental, no, the moral fortitude to go to those people and beg for their forgiveness, to get on his knees and say, I'm so sorry for putting you through that. Because the, the families are built up with hope. They're built up with, we're going to see our kid again. You know, he's been wrong in the past. But, you know, there's just a part of you that wants it so bad that you want to hope and you let yourself hope. And then it doesn't happen. And from Dave Pack, nothing. I'm so sorry I did that to you. I'm so sorry to put you through that roller coaster. I promise I'll never do that again. He doesn't do that. And that speaks to the type of man that he is. Is this a shepherd? Is this, you know, I'm this old shepherd, you know, he talked about that all the time. But it's like there's two biblical principles. Out of the abundance, the, mouth, the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And by their fruits, you shall know them. Dave Pack's fruits are wicked and wrong. Those poor families go through the roller coaster, and then again, and then again. And he would repeatedly, I saw him do this myself at headquarters here in Wadsworth, call out a couple, don't you want to see your son again? Mm. After he just did this a couple months before. And the, the, the father told me, who's a really good friend of mine, he's like, he has no idea the pain he's causing my wife. And he goes, it makes me angry when my wife lets herself be filled with hope they're going to see their son again because everybody wants to see their loved ones. And he knows it's probably not going to happen, but even he would be like, I hope a little bit, and then do it again, and do it again, and do it again. And how many years can you live with that? And I felt bad for those people just in the audience. Like, what is he doing to them? I don't know if the other ministers, or maybe they do, they're not stupid people, sitting there going, man, I feel bad for them. But what are you going to do? He's the apostle. God's using him. He has a purpose for everything. Those, that's the kind of damage he's done. And then one more person uh, that I know who's, who's the, the father of a good friend of mine, he lost his wife last year. Mm. He lost his wife last year suddenly, just boom. She was there one day, and the next day she was just gone. 
whole family's in shock. Meanwhile, Dave Pack is teaching Christ is going to come on this date. Christ is going to And when I say this date, I mean like within two weeks or the next holy day that's a month away. We're not talking about, oh, in 2035, Christ is going to come. He's saying here and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I know that this man is having a hard time now because he le recently left restored with his family. His wife has been dead for about a year, and he's just now grieving. He held off his grief at least processing it, because Mr. Pack says, I'm going to see my wife real soon. So he never got to finally start coming to acceptance that his wife was gone, that the family's changed, because you know what? Mr. Pack says, Mr. Pack says, Mr. Pack says, and for six months, he seemed to be doing okay, but he's not doing okay right now. Uh, you know, my friend, I was on the phone with him before I got here. His dad is almost a broken man because of the pain that he's going through and that's the damage that Dave Pack either doesn't see, doesn't want to see, and will never admit to. And there's not a minister at headquarters that can say Mark Sabrian is a liar. That's not true. They can't say that. But what I can say is that what Dave Pack is doing, he's crippling people, he's hurting people, he's hurting them emotionally, he's breaking them spiritually. And that, that behavior, those words, is just flat out evil. I have a, a concern that if he is capable to go ahead and put a family member through a roller coaster and not allow them to do the proper grieving process. And, and I've personally been through it. There is, I don't care how many books are out there. The grieving process is a bipolar roller coaster. There is no set way to go ahead and grieve. You just, you have to go through it. And the longer you put it off, the harder it is. And to keep bringing that up for somebody, wrenching their heart out that they're going to see their loved one, that's cruel. At least to me, it's cruel. My question is, is if these people feel, the members, that the end of times is going to come, mm -hmm. what do they do about if they find out they have cancer or they have something wrong with their health? My concern is, is are they putting off getting treatment or taking care of themselves because David Pack is giving false prophecies of the end of times? Some of them, yeah. Some of them don't take trips to see their family because, well, Christ coming on Saturday, there's no point of me driving all the way out there. Some people opt not to go to the doctor or What's happened more often, maybe even before Dave Pack, and this goes all the way back to Worldwide Church of God, they're going to act on faith. I have faith that God's going to heal me. You know, and faith is a wonderful, powerful thing when it's used in a positive way. I'm, I've had experiences of faith that I could never convey to another human being that I experienced something that was real to me, that was real to me, that's faith-based. And I can't diminish anybody's uh, faith or what they believe or... Um, you know, the strength of their faith, and we don't judge those type of things anyways, but some people will walk in faith and opt not to get cancer treatment, and those people have died. Now, would they have died anyways? I'm not pointing, I'm not putting, I can't put that at the feet of Dave Pack. He's preaching what Herbert Armstrong did. There are stories from worldwide. You go online, you can find it. If you Google Herbert W. Armstrong, Worldwide Church of God, Failed Prophecies, uh, Dave Pack, David C. Pack, if you go and Google him, you'll, you'll find these kind of stories. But they all have to make an individual choice. I've asked myself, I sat there and said, wow, if I had cancer, would I do cancer treatment? And to be honest, I wouldn't. I'd be like, I'm going to act in faith that God is going to choose to heal me. And then if I die, well, then it's according to his will. I cannot say that that's a bad way of thinking. That is scriptural. But if you're holding off your cancer treatment because Dave Pack says, oh, in three months, Christ is going to come, and then you don't do it, is that an act of faith, or are you listening to a man that's kind of for, between them and God? But it certainly doesn't look good. And I don't know if that's the kind of church you would want to be a part of. But some people have, have written in and said they were healed of whatever afflictions they had. And I don't diminish those things either. I've experienced things in the, in the midst of my calling and in my conversion that uh, I can't explain where God came in and saved my life. I should be dead a couple times over, 
but I'm not. I didn't make a decision about cancer, but I understand those who do or those who don't. And it's kind of along the lines of, you know, whether people want to get a COVID shot. In Canada, RCG is saying you absolutely have to get a COVID shot because if you don't, you're out. It used to be when I was there, well, everybody kind of, you know, that's a thing for themselves and their doctor and God to work out. But when Canada started saying you can't assemble together without a COVID vaccine, that's when RCG stepped in and said, no, it's a sin if you don't do it because you're, you're uh, denying the Sabbath, you're not able to assemble. So get the COVID vaccine, get over it, or you're out. So that's, that's kind of medical related, which is why I bring it up. Wow. Um, in going into uh, his prophecies um, and talking about the, the emotional roller coaster that these members go through, I can say after our first episode, a lot of community members, people from even outside the community reached out and were very concerned in regards to the current members and the for former members. And I say that because they were concerned going, how can they help? They're mm -hmm. concerned. How can they help you? They, they feel bad. It, again, it's almost like the PTSD syndrome coming back with, with internal wounds that you cannot see like a soldier. And that's why people are concerned. Um, I just want to say to any former member out there, uh, there are people out there who support you. Um, if you need any help or any services, please feel free um, to contact and, uh, and I'll make sure I get those resources to you that people have, have given. Um, current members, just know that there is a world out there for you that is, is ready to embrace you. Um, because we've been doing this series, uh, more people are now understanding, they understand more of the backstory less of the conspiracy theories in regards to how it built because of the city and armed guards and things. People are now getting down to the nitty gritty and just know that there are people out there for you. Um, it may feel like that everybody is judgmental, but it, it's not, it's not everybody. I've mm -hmm. had nothing but a good experience in regards to this and it's about education. And I, I know that a lot of people have wanted to label Restore Church of God as a cult. And I have to be very careful in, in regards to doing that because there are many different ways that you can label a cult um, in an organization. From what I have found and, and what I feel and, and, and reaching out to other people, it's not the members. The members are just going there trying to do their good for God mm -hmm. with their families. Mm -hmm. But in a further down series, it's David Pack. Mm -hmm. He fits in some scary categories of being a leader. And the concern that some people have had, as he ages, he's in his 70s, as he ages, and these prophecies are not coming because he keeps changing them. Mm -hmm. Is he a danger? Could he decide, you know, because like Herbert Armstrong, when he passed... Everybody was kind of scrambling around trying to fix the church, and that's when the original splinters happened. What's going to happen to Restore Church of God? Does he have a plan? Some people are concerned that he may try to pull something with the members. That is scary. I'm going to first address your first comment was about the community and how they can help. For all those that are in the Wadsworth community, that know somebody's in the church currently, they are nice people. They're trying to obey God the best they can. They're in a situation where they dedicated their life to God's way, to God's morals, just because a man over them is preaching false prophecies and is a false teacher, a false apostle, a false prophet, doesn't mean that those people also have the same agenda. They're that just trying, right. they're yes. trying to get to the kingdom. They want the best for their children. They want the best for their parents. They want to see their loved ones again. They want to, you know, help the world. So the way that the Wadsworth community can actually be helpful to those people is if you know somebody who's in the church, if you see them on Facebook, send them a nice, thoughtful message. You know, just let them know 
that they're welcome in the community. Because the, the thing I didn't like when I was a member was feeling like, oh, people are going to be thinking I'm that, uh, the guy at the creepy church. And maybe they did, because the, when we go to Giant Eagle, we all, look, we all dress the same, we all look the same. And it's like, oh, they're, you're from that church. Just be nice to them. They're regular people. They're nice people. The problem is David C. Pack and the church leadership. Yeah. It is not the members. They are really good, wonderful people. And if you're kind and show compassion and uh, understanding towards them, that goes a long way. I got a lot of PMs from people I had never heard of. I didn't know here in Wadsworth, please come to our church. We hope you're okay. I mean, that goes a long way. Yes. It goes a long way. And it's very helpful. So that's what they can do. Getting back to the, your other part of the question is like kind of like looking down the tunnel of time. You know, Dave Pack is in his 70s right now. What happens when this goes on for another 10 years? Can it go on another 10 years? Is he dangerous? And I don't have an answer. I don't have a crystal ball to look into. And I'm not a prophet. I'm not even a no. minister or a deacon. But you have to look at the behavior and you have to look at the man and his character. Is it out of the realm of what if possibilities that it could turn into like a Heaven's Gate, uh, you know, San Diego kind of thing, Jim Jones? People are like, oh, aren't you worried it's going to turn into that? I personally am not worried about it, that or concerned about that. I just have a hard time believing that Dave Pack's ego would allow him to get dangerous, let's say mass suicide, as, yes. as an example. I don't think he can do that because that would be admitting failure. And I don't think his ego can stomach that. I think he's going to fight until the day he dies that Christ is coming or Christ comes. But when Christ comes, he's not going to come the way Dave Pack does. I had this converse, this very conversation with a former minister who's still a friend of mine. And I said, yeah, I'm not worried about him being a danger. And he was very hesitant. He's like, I don't know. He says, is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? Who's to say? You don't know how the man is going to develop. I mean, if you're living in a world of delusion. If you're living in a world of self-delusion, which Dave Pack has this pocket of reality that is his own, and he sucks the people around him into it. That's the only way he can keep preaching from the gospel or pre preaching from the Bible for eight years and say Christ is returning. And sometimes uh, in one month, I think it was in January, February 2020, I'd have to look at my notes, every single weekend Christ was going to come. And it's like a rational, normal human being just goes, wow, I'm really bad at this. Maybe I should stop. He doesn't think that way. He doesn't think he's bad at it. I mean, he's preached to more people than any minister on the face of the earth. He's preached to more people than Paul, he would say in his sermons. I've shepherded more than this many people than on the face of the earth. I've studied the Bible more than anybody on the face of the earth. I mean, he's that kind of human being. Is he capable of finding a reality? Maybe he's hanging out with Dr. Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, where in some alternate version of his thinking, things actually come to pass. I don't know if he's dangerous. I know he's hurting people now. I know that he's a danger to people spiritually now, mentally now. But what he's going to do in the future, that's, that's all speculation. Well, as you can see, we got to the two main topics of common, which is the financial aspect and David Pack and the titles that he has been given himself as Elijah in the Apostle. We've given some examples of what has happened to members and what is currently going on. It is for you to decide how you feel. I hope through this series that you have at least come to a few conclusions that the members themselves are just like you and I. They're not harmful. They're wonderful people. And to the former members, I apologize that you have gone through any of this. And I understand why many have not come forward. You just, you don't want to keep reliving it and you just don't want to talk about it. But I'll always have an open invitation if you would like to come and do an interview. And again, David Pack, I've extended uh, an invitation to you to come and talk and to tell your side. Um, I am not going to go ahead uh, through this entire series and put a label on this church, but I will say that taking in all the facts, I think that we can all come to a conclusion that at least at the end of the day, his sermons have hurt people, is putting an emotional toll, um, PTSD, 
and I personally have been through all this myself um, when you lose a loved one and you lose a child. And I sincerely feel the pain that the former members have gone through on that. Uh, you should have the right to grieve um, properly and to keep being told you're going to see your child over and over again, that, that's painful, I understand. Um, I hope, again, that all of you reach out again. You keep giving us your comments. We're going to try to keep this going in, in more detail of the back history so you understand how Restored Church of God came to be. Again, thank you, Mark. You have been extremely insightful coming forward. I know that you had some worries, but I think that you're doing good because you're giving a voice to former members who just, they didn't know how to come forward or talk about it. Mm -hmm. you, you've done good in showing that the members there are real people and getting rid of a lot of the stereotypes and the conspiracy theories. You have done really good. So if at all at the end of the day, God put you on this earth to, you have helped people. And I really hope that we can keep going through this series and Again, thank you for giving your personal story. I know that it is not easy, and you have been through a lot. But I know a lot of people out there are watching. And again, please feel free to reach out to Mark. Uh, he has been amazing in, in helping people or directing them where to go. Again, he's, he said he's not a minister, but he's been through it all, and he can direct you also where to go. Thank you very much for this episode and continue to episode number three soon to come. You are watching WCTV. Wadsworth Community Television.